So good afternoon and welcome. Ooh. I'm Frank Perastra. I'm Senior Vice President here at CSIS and I hold the Schlesinger Chair. But it's my great pleasure today to talk about natural gas. So natural gas, this session, when we first decided to put it together, we were stymied whether to call it a reassessment or a reevaluation of our gas resources because a lot of work's been done in that regard. Starting with the, the 2011 NPC study that really began in its infancy in 2008, 2009, when we started collecting data and looking at the shale gas development. Thank you very much. We did our first session here in 2008, picking up on that trend. And over the last four and five years, what we've seen is that the resource development in terms of wells drilled and productivity of wells, new technology and the application of that technology has led to a phenomenal increase in both the gas reserve base but also in productivity. And shale gas that was once a low percentage of U.S. gas supply is now over 35 percent inclining and is expected to be in the near future the preponderance of domestic natural gas sources. We've got dry gas from certain plays and then we've got liquids rich natural gas out in the west. Our proxy for uh, natural gas drilling, the, the well count, the rig count, no longer holds true because we're producing so much from single pads and individual wells, the efficiency of the rigs, individual wells are now producing from multiple horizons at the same time. So we thought it would be a good time to take a look and reassess with all the discussion that's gone on about natural gas exports and where we are in terms of the comfort level with gas demand and gas supply that we needed to do a reevaluation. What prompted this discussion in the NPC study, there was a, a paper, it was 1-8, uh, if I'm correct, John, um, that talked about the onshore natural gas resource. And two of our panelists and the natural gas panel actually took it upon themselves to go back and look at the NPC runs that we had. And instead of using 2009 data, update it with 2010, 11, 12, and in some cases 13. And looking at this new productivity, what that did to our, uh, our assessment and what we saw as the reality of this resource base. And so it not only raises the front end of the curve, but then raises the back end of the curve as well. Adam Siminski at EIA um, has done essentially the same thing. In real time now, we're getting data that the Energy Information Administration is putting into their model, and it's giving us a totally different look at what the resource base looks like. At the same time, because we have a clean energy agenda and concerned about climate change, we're also looking at new ways to use this natural gas in terms of demand. Power generation, transportation, new opportunities for industry. What about gas exports? What about pipeline exports to neighboring countries in addition to the LNG? So when we thought about bringing back this crew together, this is one of the largest panels that we've had at CSIS, but there's a reason for it. And the reason is that this is what we thought that it takes to actually bring and discuss this for all of you, to bring you a, a new kind of picture of this emerging reality and what it means for both supply and demand, both currently and going forward. So the folks we have on our agenda today, we're actually going to start with Dr. Paula Gant. And Paula is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for uh, Oil and Gas Resources in the Office of Fossil Energy. Um, many of you know Paula. She uh, just joined the administration after serving as Senior Vice President for Policy and Planning at the American Gas Association. And prior to that, she was a Vice President for Duke Energy. She's going to lead off the discussion, and we've asked her to actually talk about how this fits with the new policy narrative that the administration looks at going forward, not only for domestic natural gas production, but what it means for the environment, for the economy, for national security and foreign policy. When Paul is done, we're going to turn the ball over to Adam Siminski. Adam's an old friend and a familiar face here. Adam is now, the, uh, for the last 18 months, has been administrator at the Energy Information Administration. Prior to that, he spent uh, time at the National Security Council, where he was senior director for energy and climate change. And most of you know him in a prior life, where he was the senior energy analyst at Deutsche Bank. It's interesting to note that uh, Adam, on his formal resume that's on the EIA website, talks about his affiliation with CSIS as a senior energy advisor. And those of us here at CSIS always think that Adam, who isn't supposed to do policy in his role at EIA, but loves to do policy, is always one unapproved remark from joining us here on a full-time basis. 
Adam will talk about EIA's updated forecast for gas demand and growing supply. We'll then turn to Andrew Slaughter. Andrew joins us on the panel. He's a frequent uh, presenter here at CSIS as well. He is now the uh, Vice President for Energy Insight, and he leads the Insight Research Team at IHS on oil and gas upstream, environmental management, water, carbon, and global energy modeling. Immediately prior to joining IHS, he served with Shell's upstream business in the Americas, and he is also a key member of the various NPC study efforts and was on the supply task force for the NPC study. Both Andrew and Doug Tierney, who will be our next presenter, they will actually talk about how they took the NPC analysis, updated it with new data, and what they found in terms of productivity and the size of the resource base. For those of you, and as I look out at this audience, there's at least half of the members that participated in some way, shape, or form on the NPC study. The outlier estimate was 4,500 trillion cubic feet, an enormous amount of gas. The new numbers suggest an even bigger number. We had the Canadians down here last year, and the group from Canada was talking about, for North America, a number of equivalent to 10,000 trillion cubic feet. So I spent most of my career in the energy industry, and this is infinity, and this is 10,000 trillion cubic feet. It's just enormous to try to figure out what that is. Doug is currently the Vice President for Business Development at Encana. He was instrumental in pulling together the NPC, and both he and Andrew will share um, the results of that study. And then to balance the new supply picture, we asked Mary Barcella, Dr. Barcella, um, is with IHS as well. She's senior director there, and she follows North American natural gas markets, and she focuses on long-term outlooks, pricing, economics, and policy. IHS just produced a new gas demand scenario and what that might look like. And it's power generation, it's new industry, it's accelerated transformation in the transportation sector, but it also looks at exports. So to give us a flavor of what that new demand scenario might look like. And then we thought, what would be more appropriate to talk about so that there's this realization or there's this, this focus on what America could look like with this energy and these abundant energy resources. But from a producer perspective, what would be the obstacles and challenges to realizing that potential? And I could think of no one better than Clay Breaches. Clay is the vice president with Anna Darko, an operator. Um, but he also chaired the NPC study on prudent development of North American resources. And we asked Clay specifically to deal with the challenges and opportunities producers face, what they've done in terms of local and community aspects, above ground and below ground on technology, but also license to operate, dealing with water, with emissions, what that means going forward and how that impacts the resource base. So we're looking forward to a terrific panel and discussion. We will leave time uh, for plenty of, discussion, or plenty of discussion and questions at the end. And let me uh, start. I will ask uh, Dr. Gant to come up and join us and make some opening remarks, and then we'll get started. But thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Frank, for that very kind introduction. When Frank told me about the idea of putting this panel together, I was very excited and I said, I'd love to have a front row seat. I didn't know I was actually going to get a front row seat. So, very <laughs> exciting. <laughs> so, uh, these are incredibly exciting times to be in the administration as um, well as just to be in the energy industry. When uh, we think about the, the path that we've taken from 2000 to the present, who'd have thunk? We've gone from a resource that was really um, marginally producing for the country to one that is really the center of all of our conversations practically about energy, and that's our unconventional shale gas resources. So um, ex ex incredibly extraordinary times is with, within, um, and it's a great time to be working in an administration that fully appreciates the very happy circumstance we find ourselves in with this domestic abundance of these resources and very much wanting to understand the full potential of those resources to contribute to our economic prosperity, our national security, our environmental quality, and making sure that happens for decades to come. And that definitely starts at the top with President Obama and his incredible appreciation for making sure and in concern that we get this right with regard to this domestic abundance and we realize that potential. The um, what did that domestic abundance translate into? Well, we've had an incredibly uh, winter, an incredibly strong winter. Uh, polar vortex has come into our vocabulary. We saw 
in a the throughput of 140 BCF a day, or in early January at a peak, something that is just sort of mind-boggling to consider. And the market's responding quite well. Um, and that's that's something that's that's something that worth stopping and taking a moment to appreciate. And and that's one of the reasons I was so excited about this panel is we're all busy trying to understand this abundance and particular aspects of it. And sometimes it's important to just stop and take a moment to really uh, um, acknowledge where we are in the course of our history and that this is a, a fundamentally new landscape that we're looking at from an energy perspective. And to think about before we figure out what all we're going to do with it, how do we get here so we can make sure we keep, in, we keep making those sorts of decisions. And how did we get here? We got here by know-how. I think good old American know-how and American ingenuity continually to apply, apply to a very dom abundant domestic resource that we knew was there, and we were determined to get it out, in a gr out of the ground in a way that benefited our economy overall. We added to that infrastructure and an incredibly successful record of developing particularly natural gas transmission and storage and delivery infrastructure across the country. We've got 2.4 million miles of pipe in the ground, and we are the envy of the world in that regard because natural gas in the ground is nice to have. Natural gas delivered where you need it and use it is what runs our economy and powers this potential that we're all talking about. So those factors, the, our ingenuity, our know-how, our investments in R&D, technological advance, our investments in the infrastructure, have, le have led us to the point now where we're going to hear a, a lot of, of insight that informs our thinking about this new abundance. And thinking, and importantly, I think it's, 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 we need to stop and think about how we make decisions in, in this regard. We're shifting from a psyche as Americans that has previously, in my lifetime, been framed by one of energy scarcity. And we're shifting into a psychology of abundance that's completely different, new territory for us. And it, it's going to require us not only to consider new answer sets, but to consider, consider new question sets. And this is, this can, this is really personal uh, for me. I think um, I remember waiting in line in the 70s to buy gasoline. And that's something when I tell my son about it, he really is con he's convinced I am actually from another planet um, because he also can't believe I didn't have a cell phone when I was born. But that's another story. Um, he, won't, he, won't ever, he won't be faced with that sort of challenge in his lifetime. There'll be other challenges. There'll be other questions that his generation needs to answer. But we are faced with this incredible abundance, whether it's natural gas and oil domestically, energy efficiency, renewable energy, an abundance of technologies that are allowing us to think differently about how we consume and use energy and where we do that. We're all much more empowered. It's a completely new dawn. And it's important to, to make sure that we're thinking about that and not applying our old questions to our new environment. So first things first, we're shifting our psychology. We need to shift the questions that we're asking. And then what do we need to do to make sure that we realize this potential? And I'll briefly hit on a few things that I, that I think are important. One, again, we need to acknowledge what are the new market fundamentals that we understand and that they're fundamentally different than the market that we've just left. And that's what the panel is going to do here today. And I think it's really important to do, we all stop and, and acknowledge incredibly, incredibly new outcomes that we're, that we're observing. Two, um, and I think this is also going to be touched on, we have got to secure the confidence of our communities that we can produce this resource responsibly and deliver it safely to their homes and businesses now and decades into the future. To do that, we need to engage in continual improvement of our, pra our, our practices for producing and delivering the resource as well as using it. We need to make sure that we're um, implementing the, the best standards and practices with regard to environmental management. And we need to make sure that we're making the right investments to ensure economic development. So this potential that we realize is widely distributed that we can share this benefit with the local communities where the resources are, are produced, as well as across the economy. Third, we also need to uh, think about our policies. We, we need to continually look at um, policies and the current context and where we need to, to rethink based on new market fundamentals. Fourth, we need to invest, 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 whether it's in infrastructure are in R&D, which is what leads to the techno technological breakthroughs that leads to these phenomenal market outcomes that we see. Are, um, and we need to invest in our manufacturing base as well, to re again, to ensure that the potential is broadly, broadly realized across the economy. And finally, we need to realize that we 
to the extent that we transfer our domestic know-how in, in producing this resource and using this resource abroad, that that is a tremendous ability to enhance our energy security. All of those, in my view, are great questions and challenges for us to be facing right now. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing some more good news from the panel. Thanks, Frank. Thanks. So Paula talked a bit about the new narrative that we're going to develop as part of this discussion. And the first to, person to tee up both the new supply and demand case, that when we started working with uh, uh, Adam Siminski at EIA, this notion of the high resource case has now become the reference case. And we have a new high resource case, but we also have new demand numbers. So we've asked Adam to come today and present the newest forecast that EIA has available and put some texture on the numbers and, and discuss what it means to the United States. Thanks, Adam. Uh, thank you, Frank. So I thought that, uh, let's see, how about page down? No. What do I do, need to do to advance the slides? There we go. Okay. Um, I know that this is supposed to be a discussion about natural gas, but I'm going to talk a little bit about oil as well. And the reason for that is uh, simple. When you look at this growth in uh, natural gas production here and our forecast out to the year 2040 of more than 100 billion cubic feet a day of production, uh, more than 60 percent of that is uh, associated gas. That is, it's coming from wells that produce both oil and gas. So I don't think you can talk about natural gas in isolation. Uh, the number of, of places that we are producing gas from gas reservoirs alone is beginning to diminish. Uh, there was a little bit of chat ahead of the meeting here uh, today uh, about this. One of the things that we uh, know is that the rig count, looking at the oil rig count or the natural gas rig count, is no longer a very reliable uh, indicator of what's going on. So uh, if you think about all of that production, the next thing you want to think about is where is it going to go? And in the EIA's reference case forecast for the 2014 annual energy outlook, what we are uh, saying is that uh, electric power uh, is going to go up a lot. Uh, Mary Barcella will uh, give you some really good reasons why it might even go up more uh, than what we're showing here. Uh, this is under existing law and regulation, and if we see a tightening in uh, air quality rules, uh, we could see even more natural gas going into electric power. Uh, but we're also seeing this relatively big build out in industrial uh, natural gas use. And so let's look at that a little bit more closely. And here what you see is a lot of gas going into refining uh, and related activities. Well, why is that? You need heat uh, in a refinery, and that heat is being supplied by relatively uh, low cost natural gas. And so the U.S. has a natural advantage, in a sense, in refining activities because of the existence of this gas uh, that we are developing. Uh, bulk chemicals uh, also will be a big beneficiary uh, in EIA's view of the growth in natural gas production. And uh, I, I kind of like the third one because uh, you very seldom, seldom hear oil uh, and gas people uh, talk about food. Uh, at least not uh, in the sense, but it takes a lot of energy actually to process food. And natural gas uh, growth uh, is going to uh, show up in more food processing activity in the U.S., just as an example. Uh, here, kind of you see the standard forecast for more natural gas being used in transportation, freight trucks, uh, railroads and marine uses, uh, probably for LNG. One of the interesting things that's not on this slide that was on it last year, so I just want to call it to your attention, is natural gas uh, being used uh, in gas to liquids activities. So a year ago, we thought that natural gas uh, could end up uh, being converted into uh, liquid fuels, and uh, the economics of that just aren't looking uh, as, as good. That's a it's a lesson for everybody, actually, when you think about long-term forecasts, that even in the course of one year and a long-term forecast, that some things can come in and some things can go off. 
uh, of, of your forecast, and it might make a difference. Uh, even with uh, greater use of natural gas domestically, uh, EIA's uh, estimates are that there's plenty left over, uh, that the U.S. will become a net exporter of natural gas uh, very shortly, uh, before the end of this decade. Uh, and, you know, last year we thought it would be early in the next decade, and these things keep creeping up, and I'm going to show you another slide about that. We are already a big pipeline exporter of natural gas to Mexico, and we think that that will continue to grow. Uh, we both import and export gas, uh, mainly by pipeline from Canada, and, uh, and I suspect that uh, cross-border trade of U.S. gas into Canada uh, from the Marcellus, for example, uh, is likely to pick up. And then we have LNG uh, exports. Uh, this is not a forecast of who's going to get a permit. Uh, this is a forecast based on uh, how the national energy model that EIA uses uh, allocates uh, the economic uh, viability of natural gas exports. And what we're saying is that those numbers uh, are going to grow fairly substantially over time. Uh, I said I was going to talk just a little bit about oil, because uh, one of the things I think you want to keep in mind is, is that, uh, that oil is several years behind, in, in one sense, uh, what we're seeing happening in natural gas in terms of this issue of resource abundance. Our model currently still shows um, tight oil production moving up sharply, but then beginning to level off and come down. Uh, we said that last year. We're still saying that uh, this year. There is one difference, though. Last year, uh, that uh, level was several million barrels a day below uh, what uh, we're saying in the 2014 uh, annual energy outlook. We now see total U.S. Uh, crude oil production rising to almost 10 million barrels a day, uh, and, and that's uh, going to be upon us very shortly. Uh, because we think that will happen sometime around 2016 or 2017. Uh, Where is all that going to go? Uh, well, one of the things that we do know is, is that uh, transportation, which absorbs a lot of uh, U.S. Uh, oil, and including what we import, uh, two-thirds of oil consumption in the U.S. goes into transportation uses, roughly. Uh, that's not going to grow a whole lot, and it might actually shrink. And uh, motor gasoline consumption uh, we see coming down. Uh, we do envision a pickup in uh, diesel, jet fuel, and even uh, ethanol, uh, but the total in 2040 uh, is going to be less uh, than what we're currently using. Um, well, that means there's some of that left over then, too. <laughs> in one sense. And one of the things that we found is, is that our refineries, uh, particularly the ones in the Gulf Coast of the U.S., had been operating at below uh, their design utilization rates. And uh, with a pickup in uh, utilization and the growth in domestic production, we've seen a big pickup in exports of products uh, from the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is now a net product exporter. Uh, if you say, well, where is that uh, oil going uh, in the form of gasoline and diesel fuel uh, and other products. Uh, largely uh, Latin America, especially gasoline down there and diesel fuel into Europe. And uh, those numbers uh, have climbed tremendously. Uh, we're showing a number there around 2012 that hit 3 million barrels a day, but on a monthly basis at the end of 2013, uh, we think that exports may have actually reached close to 4 million barrels a day. Um, final slide. Um, uh, if you look at the, the, it's a little hard to see there, but there's, there's the two blue lines are dotted, uh, at least on my version of this, they're dotted, are they? They're not here, though, are they? Yeah. The, the slightly lighter line, I guess you can kind of see the dots. Um, the, those represent, the, the bottom one is the reference case. Uh, the top lines represent the high resource case from last year. We haven't published a high resource case yet. And my rough idea of what the high resource case could look like uh, when we come out with it in a month or so. Uh, the uh, red lines, the one that's in the middle is the reference case for 2014. Uh, the lower one is last year's um, low 
uh, demand, kind of low import case uh, that was based on uh, things like uh, extension uh, and, and improvements in auto fuel efficiency, uh, substitution of natural gas into the transportation sector, and a few other uh, things along those lines. Uh, the one that's at the top is an interesting one to keep in, in mind, uh, and that, that is actually what the demand case looks like in a high oil and gas reference case. And so it goes up from the reference case. Why does it go up? Well, the reason it goes up is because you have more supply. More supply generally tends to lead to lower prices, and lower prices and abundant supply lead to more demand, and we end up um, with, uh, with more demand. Now, you could offset that by doing other things, uh, in, you know, from a policy perspective on things like auto fuel efficiency, um, but uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, case. One of the things that you see where those two lines cross uh, out past 2030, the blue and the, the lower red line, I think that's around 2032 or 2033. That was an estimate of could the U.S. become a net exporter of petroleum? And we said yes, and a high reference, high uh, resource case and a low demand case, kind of a, the, you know, how would you get the lowest level of imports case? Uh, that could happen. Uh, just kind of putting rough numbers on paper here, uh, based on what we are looking at now in the AEO 2014, if you ran the same kind of analysis, uh, you'd get the same kind of result, but it moves back and up. So you have a uh, higher uh, production number and a more rapid move towards um, a, uh, a zero export case. Uh, in general, I think the message that I would like to leave you with uh, today is, is that as we have seen in gas and are continuing to see, some of these same uh, issues, uh, I think, are going to become apparent on the oil side uh, with the improvements in technology on both supply and demand uh, leading to a more uh, rapid move uh, towards this idea of abundance rather than scarcity. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Evan. So that was the EIA, the U.S. government's uh, newest projection. We're going to turn now to Andrew and Doug to talk about how they updated the, the NPC analysis and what that might mean in terms of uh, total productivity by 2025 or so. Thanks, Annie. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to set the scene for a couple of minutes um, to remind you of what we said in the 2011 NPC Prudent Development Study about gas resources and the gas supply potential. And then I'll turn it over to Doug to talk about the great work he and his team have done in bringing up our, uh, our, our thinking based on more recent data and showing how our levels of confidence and our conclusions have evolved since then. I think we should remember just uh, when, we, when we look back to those times that work with, that was published in 2011 was based on data that was available through 2009 and 2010. So we were far earlier on the maturity curve in our understanding and our stage of development in unconventional gas and even more so unconventional oil. If I can just, which one is? Oh, it's that one. Okay, so we concluded that natural gas resources have the potential to supply the market for decades. That was our, our takeaway line. We based these conclusions on some resource work that had been published by MIT uh, in the early stages of our study, and that, that work looked at um, supply curves. The one in green is a fair, very conservative supply curve, really based on the notion that unconventional technologies are not going to take off in any bigger way. They'll either be technically or economically underperforming, restricting the economic supply base. The blue line was the so-called advanced technology case, and that was really integrating unconventional technologies into the supply system. And the brown line there was the combination of high res higher resource estimates with uh, 
real proper deployment of unconventional technologies. And so the conclusion was if we stay around those yellow and blue lines, we can probably um, supply that range of demand at fairly reasonable cost. The horizontal bar there is the, is the range of cumulative demand through 2035. If we look at that in a slightly different way, um, again, looking at the low, low demand case and the high demand case in 20, 2035, the end of our outlook period, um, there's a huge range in the ability of supply to demand that, depending on whether the unconventional revolution is successful. At that stage, the jury is somewhat still out. You have to envisage a, a future in which perhaps um, unconventional technologies don't maintain their promise, or perhaps regulatory impedimenta stop progress in unconventional development. And in that case, supply is probably not enough to meet the, even the low outlook for domestic demand. So we would be back in a position which we thought we were going to be in earlier in the decade when we we're going to be big LNG importers and probably at a much higher market clearing price for that uh, market structure than domestic supply. But the more we, we push demand very high, and we looked at success cases for unconventional development, and the success cases for unconventional development, basically our conclusion was we could meet even very aggressive demand growth projections over the next 20 years if the unconventional resource potential uh, met its promise and if that momentum is maintained. So that was all based on 2009-2010 data. We've moved down the road. We have more recent data. And Doug and his team took a look at this um, in the last several months. And he's going to give us an update on what our conclusions now are, how we've evolved in our thinking. Doug. Hi, Dander. OK. So since we published our MPC work, we have uh, three more years of, of data, and arguably uh, getting very close to four. And uh, my company largely produces natural gas, so we're very acutely and painfully aware <laughs> of the uh, relationship with price and, and uh, natural gas production. Uh, from the bottom up point of view, so the work we did, just to be clear, as Andrew said, uh, we really relied on a body of work that was published by MIT, uh, who, who supplied the bottom up uh, point of view. And we, we did not, in this update, go back and redo that. that that's a, that's a, a, a large effort to, to do that. But we do know a few things. We know that new discoveries have been and continue to be made, both in the dry gas world and certainly the uh, advent of uh, associated gas now with particularly the full spectrum plays like the Duvernay or the Eagleford Shale uh, have really brought to light uh, as, uh, yet another layer of, of resource uh, that will need to be quantified at some point in time. Um, also, more recent studies like uh, the Potential Gas Committee and uh, Adam's work uh, continue to gas resource estimates. Uh, and, and actually, the NPC, uh, both the My Onshore Gas Group, as well as there was another group that did a, uh, call it an industry slash academia uh, other interested party survey. All of these numbers are, are, are converging on the same figures, and they continue to grow. So all this, uh, as I was digesting this and gave Andrew and John a, a call, John Guy, I uh, said, you know, really, when we published our report, uh, we were looking at this, this suite of data. And you can see on the bottom there, shale gas can, starts to contribute on the bottom. There's still a little bit of lingering doubt. And, uh, when, we, when we looked at the MIT data, we, we, we set forth, we don't really know exactly where this is, but we laid out a low, medium, and I'll call it high, what isn't really high, uh, case. And it just became very, very apparent that the, the low side case could just be disregarded today. And I uh, thought it'd be prudent to, uh, you know, publish that and, and make that point. And it, uh, it's, it's certainly been well received, and uh, here we find ourselves today discussing it. Uh, just point out some things on this graph. Uh, 
scale, Paula mentioned, you know, it's, this is a generational issue. Uh, the labels down there are 20 year increments, you know, 1900 to 1920 to 1940 and so forth. Uh, you know, back when we published, uh, you can see that, you know, shale gas, while it looked very robust, we just didn't know how big it could really be. Here we are three years later, and you can see now the blue line, just, it's just on a meteoric rise. Um, I should explain the other, other curves on here. The, uh, the green line uh, that, that uh, intersects the blue line, that's what we call old unconventional technology, so that would be CBM it would be uh, multi-stage fracturing in vertical wells. And so what I'm really distinguishing here that we're calling shale, it's, to be clear, it's cost-effective multi-stage fracturing in horizontal well bores. And that's not actually limited to shale. There's a few examples of silt stones and other type reservoirs where that, uh, that's germane. The, uh, the, the kind of pink line you see there, that would be conventional uh, onshore. Again, we were charged with onshore. Certainly, if you layered in offshore, that would, that would uh, uh, alleviate the kind of peakiness you see there back in 1973. Um, and you can see then, as we started developing unconventional resources, first with the green line and now with the blue, it's just had a phenomenal impact on, on the overall supply side picture. So switching gears a little bit from, from rate time now, I want to take you into the uh, cost, our uh, cost of supply or price versus cumulative production. And I, I realize these are a little hard to look at, but I'm a, I'm a technocrat at heart, so you'll have to bear with me. Uh, again, scale on this is extremely important. I'll, I'll introduce, uh, uh, just to make the conversation easier, uh, a term called a, a quad. It's a quadrillion cubic feet. That's 1,000 TCF. So to date, uh, when we first did the study, uh, we had produced about 1.1 quads, so 1,100, uh, if I could point you there, or direct your eyes. The last three points, you know, it takes about three, a little over three years to actually span one of the little bitty increments on, on this particular scale. So scale is important. Um, if you think about resource depletion of, uh, of uh, a finite resource, you know, there's general, there's some debate about this, but you kind of get about halfway through depleting that resource, and then you get to a production rate. It's really hard to maintain that production rate, and you end up in some sort of terminal decline. So one way to kind of look at this graph and think about, well, what should the, the cost or price of this product be is to, to think about doubling or going out twice beyond. If we were really at some sort of uh, peak or plateau, you can just go out twice as far as what we've produced to date and get some idea on what should the price of the product be. If we were still on the blue line, the case one, uh, you know, if you, if you follow your eyes out to say 2.4 quads, you can go up there and see if we were still on the blue line, the, the cost of the product would be, you know, somewhere in that seven or eight dollar range. Well, it's not, I mean, we know it's not. So again, this was just some evidence, some top-down evidence that we looked at to say, you know, that, that top line today with what we know has happened is just irrelevant. It, it just is impossible. And hence the little uh, squiggly black line there. That's, uh, that's Andrew's art, artwork. I, I, won't, I won't take credit for it. <laughs> so point being is, I mean, these curves, they're very dynamic, uh, you know, difficult to estimate. A lot of work goes into them. Uh, but the point is, they're going down and to the right. We're finding more and more supply at less and less cost. And that, that's really the big takeaway for today. How big could this get? And if I could just, uh, uh, case three, uh, we actually did our study all the way up to a $20 cutoff price, somewhat arbitrary. Uh, that's $120 a barrel, if you want to talk energy equivalents, which actually is not out of the realm of reason when you think of oil today. Um, if you do that, the actual cutoff is about four and a half uh, quads. I'll round that to five just for argument's sake, because we know it's getting bigger. Uh, but how big might this get? And uh, it was actually in the appendix uh, in, in the study we, we published a few years ago, but thought I'd bring it to the forefront. Uh, Dr. S.A. Holditch uh, and some of his uh, colleagues at uh, Texas A&M University did a study back in 2008, 2008 right? This is before we even know what 
well before we know what we know today. And uh, they, they uh, looked at in, in some select basins what that contribution of uh, ultimate recovery would be from conventional and unconventional resources. And you, you know, just eyeballing that, you can kind of see it was about a 90 to 10 percent uh, breakout. And we know some of these basins, uh, you know, since 2008 have had enormous uh, advances in what they will ultimately deliver for unconventional. And, you know, highlight there Appalachian probably being the most dramatic of those. Back in 2008, Marcellus wasn't that big of a deal. Uh, so this will probably improve, is the point. And uh, when, you, when you think about that, you know, if you, if you go back to that original rate time graph I showed you, our, our rate, uh, our the cumulative uh, production curve, we've produced about one quad of conventional gas. So doing a, you know, simple math times 10. Uh, that, that just says that, you know, this is onshore only, could ultimately be, say, up to 10 quads of the 10,000 TCF that, that Frank mentioned. Uh, this, you know, it is somewhat of a guess at this point, no doubt about it. But, but the point is, is that there is a lot of gas, uh, an awful lot of gas. And as Paula mentions, you know, now the real question is, what do we do with it? Um, economics drive all this. Uh, this winter's been quite interesting. I found it quite interesting. It's really a test case. Uh, and, you know, seeing the, the price behave such as it has is really a testament, I think, to the, the bountiful supply that we do have available to us today. That's it. Thanks, Tom. Okay, so we've heard a bit about the supply forecast. In fact, under this new trajectory, it's in excess of 95 BCF a day by 2025. Substantial amount of gas. We asked uh, Mary to come and talk about what gas demand could look like. And then as we get into the discussions, we'll talk about what if there's a low demand case? Where does the supply go? What if there's a higher demand case and it's accelerated? What if during the interim periods we actually see hiccups so that on either a seasonally adjusted basis or if there's supply disruptions or a technology, specific technology takes off, will this transition be smooth? Can we do things to facilitate that? So, Thank Dr. Marcello? Um, and yeah, the answer is we don't think the transition will be smooth, but go. we've got lumps of new demand coming online in our outlook in the next few years. And the question is, well, I'm Jumping ahead to my final slide, the, the question is, will supply be there to meet these incremental um, increases in the lumps in the demand? Uh, but first, just our overall view of the next uh, 22 years or so. This is, I'm showing our uh, IHS projections of final demand plus exports, U.S. lower 48, comparing to AEO um, early release 2014. Um, of the same thing, although they include Alaska, so that, that would bump up a, about a BCF a day that we don't have in our outlook. The main, but what I want to point out is that the main difference in the two outlooks is in our projections for power sector gas demand. Um, we think the power sector is going to increase its gas demand by far more than EIA thinks it will. And a major reason for that difference is in differences in our projections of electricity demand increase. We have electricity demand growing at about 1.3 percent per year. Um, EIA's electricity demand grows, I think, at about 0.8 percent per year. So a big difference uh, there. And when you can factor in the increased demand for electricity, need for power generation, the phase out of coal-fired power generation plants that we believe will be largely uh, taken over by gas-fired generation, then that, that gives a big difference in our, in our outlook for uh, power sector natural gas demand, which is the big growth area in our outlook. Um, the reason for that, and here I actually have an EIA slide that shows uh, over the past 35 years how your basic uh, uses for electricity, uh, space heating, space cooling, water heating, refrigeration, freezing, freezers, uh, and cooking, um, have really not grown that much as you would have expected with growth in population, growth in housing, and so forth, 
which really points to the efficiency or the, or the efficacy of efficiency and conservation measures. They've been highly effective in keeping those uses of electricity fairly stable over the years. But what has changed is our cell phones that we did not have in 1977, computers, uh, high definition televisions, huge screen TVs, uh, you know, communication servers of uh, hardware all across the country that use a lot of electricity that was simply not there before. Um, so we think that that effect, new uses for electricity, will continue to increase um, electricity demand, and that's the main reason why we uh, have a much higher rate of growth in electricity demand in our forecast, I think, than, than EIA does. Um, whoops, wrong way. So here's, a, here's another way of looking at our outlook, and this just shows the growth through 2035 compared to 2008. And you can see in the recent years, uh, through last year, there was a lot of gas being used for coal displacement. So because gas prices were so low, we backed out a lot of coal in power generation. Um, we simply outcompeted coal on a, on a cost of generation basis. Uh, we don't see that going forward because we do expect prices to firm, or prices have firmed back up. We expect them to remain firmer and uh, not sub three dollars like we had in 2012. So we we no longer have the coal displacement effect, but we do have the strong growth in power sector demand for gas that you see in the blue section there. What else do we have? Well, we have, you, you hear a lot about LNG exports. We do have, I think, similar uh, amounts of exports that EIA has, about 5.5 BCF a day by 2035 from the U.S. lower 48. Um, chemicals and manufacturing. Yes, there is a strong manufacturing renaissance going on, uh, partly, in large part, because of access to lower cost uh, natural gas um, and fuel, other fuel supplies, but it's not that big an impact on natural gas demand because, largely because it's concentrated in the chemical sector, it's concentrated in facilities that are reshoring, coming back to the states because of the low cost natural gas liquids. So it's the ethane that they're coming here for the feedstock their actual use of natural gas and process heat is not that great. Um, ammonia and methanol do use natural gas for feedstock, and so we, we have some um, increases there owing to those effects. But overall, we see industrial use from chemicals growing by about 1.2, about 1. Point, no, I'm sorry, growing by about 1.8 BCF a day. Um, another 0.8 BCF a day um, from other gas-intensive industries. At the same time, you've got a lot of gas-intensive industries that are not growing very fast or actually declining uh, for competitive reasons totally apart from the cost of fuel. Um, when those industries don't grow, they don't use gas or they don't use more gas. So uh, we are not, from, from the point of view of industrial sector gas consumption, we don't have as huge an increase as you might expect from listening to um, you know, the headlines about all the facilities that are coming back and, and have these great growth plans. Yes, they do. Yes, they're making a big uh, contribution to the economy. It's really good. It really is a manufacturing renaissance. But compared to other sectors of growth for natural gas consumption, it's, it's not that big an impact. Um, natural gas vehicles. We, we do see quite a bit of growth, uh, particularly after 2020. A lot of that in our outlook is concentrated in uh, heavy-duty trucks, where we do think the LNG is making great inroads already. We'll continue to. We have some increase in, in other transportation in there as well, but, but the bulk of the growth is in the heavy-duty trucking. And finally, uh, exports to Mexico, which again are, are growing. We, can, we expect them to continue to grow and to add some uh, to, uh, uh, to total, total gas, U.S. gas, disposition of U.S. gas supplies. Um, a word about, let's go the other way, back to the beginning. A word about the residential and commercial sectors. This is where our basic outlook, EIA's basic outlook, 
nobody sees a lot of growth in those sectors. Um, and for a number of reasons, number one is uh, energy conservation effects, number two is the continued shift of population into warmer areas where you just don't need gas for space heating as much or where electric heat pumps do outcompete uh, or make more sense than, uh, than gas. So a lot of reasons why uh, typical projections of residential commercial growth are pretty static. And in fact, there's been virtually no growth for the past 20 or 30 years in those sectors. So this study that we just completed for the American Gas Foundation looked at that and said, okay, what could move the needle here in residential and commercial sectors? A number of areas, um, and number one, which is going on already to a great extent, is displacement of oil heat in the Northeast. Um, elsewhere, it can make a lot of sense once uh, the word gets out, once homeowners, regulators, builders, communities realize that this change is real and do accept the outlook that gas uh, prices are likely to be lower than, and considerably lower than competing fuels for a long time to come. Um, and perhaps change their heating fuel, increase demand uh, for space and water heat for cooking um, to natural gas. Um, natural gas vehicles, again, certain barriers to be overcome, the potential there is quite large. And if you can get the home refueling uh, equipment and systems to marketable levels, uh, significant growth potential there. Needs a lot of institutional support from the natural gas distribution companies needs a lot of regulatory support. There are a lot of barriers in terms of financing. How do you pay for the cost of, of expanding your distribution systems? Comes back to infrastructure largely. So um, uh, I think we'll, we'll be hearing a lot more about infrastructure. The resource seems to be settled. Infrastructure is the next frontier. So um, upside demand potential, again, residential, commercial, natural gas vehicles, perhaps the gas intensive industries grow faster than we have in our outlook. Greater demand response to lower prices. This is something that we haven't quite seen yet, but I think it's, if, if it's not there yet, I think it's coming that uh, in the future we, we won't be setting our thermostats back quite so low on a, on a cold day. Um, and then it may be that, that the LNG exports and the exports to Mexico increase um, faster than, than we think at this point. There's significant upside potential there. Downside risk, slower growth in all those areas. Um, low global demand for LNG um, could happen if other countries develop their own indigenous resources more quickly. Uh, methane hydrates in Japan, I think, is a big question mark in, in the longer term. And as has also been uh, discussed here, if we have greater limits on our own development through regulatory uh, reasons for the social license to operate, if methane emissions become a greater concern, if CO2 emissions from natural gas use become a, a greater concern, maybe those uh, uses would be limited. Resource adequacy, this is our own resource estimate from a, a few years ago when we looked at 18 plays, very similar to what you just saw from the NPC and the MIT work. Um, we, we think there is 50 years worth of consumption, even including our, well, well I guess these are at current consumption rates, but um, at prices of $7 or less. So, so this resource base is quite abundant, quite low cost, can sustain quite a bit of expanded demand. Um, but uh, going back to, here, here's my last slide, I think, going back to what we said uh, earlier, we do see a big jump in demand coming in 2015, 16, and 17 as new gas-fired power plants uh, come online, as more uh, coal generation is retired, as LNG exports start to take off, and as the new chemical expansions and, and so forth, uh, those facilities start to come online. Within the next three to four years, question is, will producer, producers have seen that 
demand increment coming, and will they have drilled the wells and gotten the production up to the level that it needs to be when that uh, new demand comes on? If not, you're going to see a temporary spike in prices. Producers will respond to that. You'll get the supply you need. Prices will come back off. Again, it's, it's a question of deliverability, not a question of resource adequacy. So I think that's it. Thank you. Mary, thanks. That's terrific. So we've asked Clay, it, as a producer, but then also stepping back from his Anadarko role with his NPC hat on, to just talk about license to operate and what, what producers are seeing in the field. What are their challenges and opportunity? If the resource is there, how do we get it aground, out of the ground and how do we deliver it? And I think a lot does come back to infrastructure. I, one point I would add to Mary's piece is that what we've seen historically is the midstream takes longer to develop than the upstream, right? Upstream is drilling wells, and the downstream on the oil side takes longer to develop than the midstream. So we've got a sequencing gap here, and if we have, as Mary suggests, that the resource is more than adequate, but at any specific point in time along that curve, if you have an upsurge in demand, how do we actually deliver that product, get it out of the ground, and get it to consumers that need it? Clay. So great. On. So Mary, I, I feel like that was a direct challenge to me. <laughs> and one of the things, I, I just will respond briefly to that, um, that we found in the prudent development study was that the elasticity of supply is so much higher now with resource plays relative to where we were years ago when we were producing out of the Gulf of Mexico and it took five to seven years to develop projects that could deliver this high demand of natural gas. Now that we're doing this in the onshore, and I'll show you just a minute what we are doing and how we were proceeding with with drilling efficiencies and such, I think I can answer your question. Frank had asked me to come today and talk about some of the issues that could possibly derail this great news story that we have. And I, I do want to thank Doug and his team for, for getting us to the podium in the first place. All this work that you have generated precipitated this today, and I think it's good discussion and timely. So before we get too far into this, let's just you know, back to the basics and talk about what got us here in the first place, and that's the convergence of technology between horizontal drilling, multi-pad drilling, and hydraulic fracturing. It has yielded amazing results. And this was recognized a few years ago when we commissioned two, two major studies, one the National Petroleum Council study, Prudent Development study, and the other the Secretary of Energy Advisory Board report on shale gas development. Work has been underway since then by industry, and I'll report back on that in just a moment, as to some of the initiatives that have taken place since then. Just a refresher on the amazing endowment of unconventional resources that we have here in the United States. And one thing I'd like to point out, I mean, obviously you have the Appalachian Basin on the, the northeast, and you, you come down into the Haynesville and the Eagleford in South Texas and, and Louisiana, up into the Barnett. The Woodford up in Oklahoma, you move into the Piants and the Niobrara up in the Colorado, Utah areas, and then all the way up into the Bakken, which is just a phenomenal oil play in and of itself. But one thing I'd like to point out with this particular map, and, and we've all seen it hundreds of times, but just the vast geographical expanse that this represents. And the reason this unconventional play is, is so vast, obviously because it covers a lot of, of geography, but it also affects a great number of people. The population that this affects is much different than what we had with conventional resources in the past, be it in the Gulf of Mexico, be it in South Texas, be it in West Texas or, or Eastern New Mexico. So we have a much different situation today, which is one of the reasons that when we talk about public trust and the social license to operate, it becomes so, so important because it affects so many people. So let me move on a little bit and let's talk about rig count. You know, in the past, we used rig count as a proxy of activity. We could count on it. If, if rig count was up, we knew that we were producing more oil or gas. If it was down, less. What you see here in, in pretty horrible color display up here, and I apologize for that, but the green bars on the bottom of this graph, if you, if you take a look at the last five years of rig count, represent those rigs that are drilling for oil. The red bars represent those rigs that are drilling for gas. That blue line that runs through here represents the number of rigs that are drilling either horizontally or some type of a, a slant hole drilling, directional drilling. So one thing I want to point out here is that currently 
78% of the rig fleet is searching for liquids versus 54% two years ago. So a significant change as we move from the gas plays to the oil plays. Approximately 81% of onshore drilling is either horizontal or directional. What you'll see is that there's a bit of a, drip, a, a dip in rig count in that 2011-2012 time frame to where we are in 2013, which might imply to some that we've had reduced activity. But if we look at this proxy of activity, which is actually a better proxy in these days, and that is of onshore footage drilled and well count. So I'll back up again and I'll just show you. We've had a dip in rig count. We've actually had an increase in footage drilled. Again, green represents oil footage drilled, red represents natural gas footage drilled. But if we look at this, we see that the overall, overall footage, or excuse me, overall well count has increased over this time frame. There's a bit of a shift since rigs are becoming so much more efficient, both in reduced days per well and overall footage drilled, and you see a, a much better way to gauge, gauge activity today. Over the last three years, average footage per well has increased 40%, and the number of wells drilled per year has increased 20%. I want to give you a high-level summary, just a comparison of 2010 versus 2013. I know that a number of you in here crunch numbers for a living, so I want to be very careful when I talk about these production figures. What I did was take November of 2013 versus November of 2010, just for clarity. But what we see is crude oil production up 40%. We see natural gas production up 13%. And this is surprising given the number of rigs that are now drilling for liquids versus natural gas. This is because of the associated gas. As many of you know, if you're drilling for oil, you're probably going to produce a lot of gas, especially in these tight formations, because that's the energy mechanism that pushes the oil out. Rig count is only up slightly, 4%. Well count is up 20%, which shows that we're becoming more efficient. Footage per well, up 40%. So I'm going to put on my Anadarko hat for a moment, take a look at what we're doing in the Eagleford. I asked one of our drilling engineers to put this together for me, and he wanted to show everything on one graph, and I, I love him for it. <laughs> but I don't want you to really look at the numbers. Let me tell you this. The, the lines that are supposed to go up are going up. The lines that are supposed to go down are going down, and the lines that are supposed to stay flat are flat. But let me, do, let me give you a few of the figures that we have here. Uh, we have experienced a reduction in drilling days per well drilled of 40%. So we've reduced our time that the rigs are there for, by 40%. A remarkable increase in footage drilled per day of 81%. And again, this is over a three-year time frame. An increase of wells drilled per quarter of 133%. All this with an average rig count of approximately 10 rigs. Now, I could have shown you this graph for our Wattenberg field, which is another one of Anadarko's major plays, and it would look identical to this, maybe even busier just because it's such a busy place. But it would look just like this, and you'd see the same types of ramp-ups. This is occurring all over the industry. So we have a good news story. We've talked about how we have increased resource, increased production, increased efficiency. You know, a lot of times when we talk about increased demand, we work, you know, exports and such, we worry about what could that possibly do to, to price. One of the things that's really interesting is we see our costs going down, our wellhead development costs going down just because we're becoming so much more efficient. And there's still room to, to, to make moves on that. These, these are all positive events. So we look at what could slow this down, what could make this good news story go sour, you know, what do producers lie awake at night worrying about. And I've put some of the major issues on the board here, and, and you know, interestingly enough, these are some of the same major issues that we were looking at three and four years ago when we started the prudent development study. So they have not changed, but what has changed, again, is the geographical expanse and the population of this country that we affect. And if you don't believe that these are real issues, you look anywhere around the world that has not developed shale gas resources, and you understand that these are the, the very things that stop them from doing so. So 
these are basically issues that could cause public trust to diminish and for us as producing, produ the producing community not to have a social license to operate. So you ask questions, are there effective regulations? And are there effective regulators? Are there enough regulators? Frack fluid additives, even though we have frack focus through the Groundwater Protection Council, are we disclosing enough as producers? Competitive water use, we're competing with agriculture for water and, and other end users. Potential for groundwater contamination. These are all issues on, on communities' minds. Surface impacts, not the least of which are related to traffic, road, and noise, as well as air emissions, including methane, as Mary spoke about earlier. So these are all big issues, not to be ignored. So the National Petroleum Council came up with a recommendation, actually came up with several recommendations, but with, related to this partic these particular issues, with the idea that we should establish regional councils of excellence to identify best practices for environmental health and safety and operating in a socially responsible way. And the major objective here was to share and disseminate best practices with producers and regulators and importantly engage all stakeholders. Now there was another body of work that came out approximately at the same time from the Secretary of Energy's advisory board. This report on shale gas development came up with a similar concept of these regional councils but preferred a national organization rather than regional ones. It did suggest, however, that such an organization would likely work through regional subgroups. So again, recognizing the difference, differences between regions, hydrogeology, traffic issues, hunting issues, all the things that matter to individual communities. So here's the industry response thus far. The industry has been hard at work trying to make these councils of excellence come to pass. You see the Marcellus Shale Co Coalition exist, developing best practices for producers in the Marcellus. The Appalachian Shale Recommended Practices Group, which was 11 of the Appalachian's largest producers coming together to identify and disseminate best practices to all stakeholders, including stronger IOGCC and regulators. The Center for Sustainable Shale Gas Development, which is very similar, however, a smaller group, and it has a self-audit function, much like the Center for Offshore Safety. In Colorado, there is a responsible operator council that's being crafted as we speak. This has many of the features, I'll talk about some of the important attributes from my perspective that exist in these councils of excellence. And, and this particular one, I think, it embodies most of those. In the Eagleford Shale, you have the Eagleford Task Force, which was put together by David Porter, who is the railroad commissioner, one of the railroad commissioners in the state of Texas. The South Texas Energy and Economic Roundtable, also known as STEER, is a group that engages not only the community, but producers as well for ensuring best practices. In the Bakken, you have the Bakken Production Optimization Program that focuses not only on production optimization, but also on best practices for the environment. In the offshore, you have the Center for Offshore Safety, has 29 members. That group also has a self-auditing function, it's a, a smaller group. Um, and in the oil sands, you have the Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance. So a lot of groups in, in these major resource plays that are trying to make sure that they are getting the best practices out there. Now let me uh, also mention another group, and, and actually this isn't even a group, this is a concept that I, I know very little about, but we saw it came out with the President's State of the Union fact sheet, and it has to do with sustainable shale gas growth zones. The fact sheet stated that the objective was to provide regions with technical assistance and regional planning so that they can withstand boom-bust cycles. We're not sure what this means exactly and how the plan will be executed, but we learn, look forward to learning more. So, so you can see everyone kind of wants to get a bite of this apple. They realize that this is extremely important for the sustainability of this good news story. Now what I've outlined here from my own perspective are some of the attributes of a successful center of excellence. I'd like to share those with you. First of all, they identify best practices. They don't necessarily develop them because that's not what they're geared for. There are a lot of resources, including the American Petroleum Institute, 
Society of Petroleum Engineers, IPCA for international standards that can be leaned upon, and we do lean upon them because we're a member of, of many of these groups up here, I can tell you. Engagement of all stakeholders. I sit in a lot of meetings, a lot of industry um, associations, a lot of gatherings of producers, and I hear the E word a lot, but it's, it's not engagement, it's education. If only we could educate the public better, they'd understand us. I sometimes feel the same way at home with my wife. If only my wife would listen to what I had to say. <laughs> I think engagement's a much better word because engagement implies that you listen as well as you provide information. And granted, the industry has a lot of information to share, but they have a lot to learn from the communities in which they are producing. Dissemination to all stakeholders using effective means. Industry associations as appropriate, websites and social media. I can't say enough about the social media side. So many of, of us as producers find that if we can educate by means of a town hall, that should be adequate. And what we find is really not that many people can attend town halls because a lot of the folks who you'd like to be there are working parents, they have kids in school that have homework and probably a soccer game that night. So you're not going to get everybody at a town hall. So in order to adequately engage and engage much larger areas and a, a much better cross-section of the demographics that you want to touch, we need to use this social media in a much better way. And this type of organization should not be in the advocacy business. This is my opinion, but I find it that if you're busy advocating, you're probably not engaging. And so that gets me back to my previous point on engagement. It's, it's one-way flow and that's outward flow. So these types of groups really should be in the, the learning, listening, and identifying best practices to deal with the issues in the region in which they're operating. So my closing remark here, is that we can only realize a huge benefit of our natural gas and oil resource endowment if we do so in a responsible manner. And that is incumbent on both industry and government alike. We do not want to spoil this unparalleled opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Clay. So the, the basic takeaway, as I understand it, is that the resource base is large and getting larger. And the more we learn about the shale, and really the lab is in the field. I mean, that's what we've done for the last five years. So we're learning about how to extract more economically and environmentally from these shale deposits. The question to me is, even under high demand case, that there seems to be adequate supply. And as Paula set us up for at the beginning, it's the deliverability. So how do we deliver it in a timely manner at an affordable price to consumers that want it? And that's going to be the crux of the argument. And so since that's part of the discussion here, I'm going to start with a question to Clay. As, as we start looking at this resource base, if we see price spikes and we talk about consumer confidence, and also Doug as, as a producer um, to weigh in on this as well, what you see in the field and how you translate that, how do you give um, confidence to consumers that the resource is there and can be there? And then along with that, I'm going to ask Dr. Gant to come back up here and join us for the Q&A session so we get a policy perspective as well. Okay, so Frank, to answer your question on the uh, price spikes, what we, what we turn to generally on this question is the resource curves themselves. And you've seen already a relatively low wellhead development cost scenario for the higher technology cases. So at the wellhead, we see relatively low cost of development, which ultimate, most of the time does translate into better pricing for consumers. There are times, and we can look back not to, you know, just a few weeks ago, when you do see price spikes in regions because of a lack of infrastructure. We saw this in the propane markets. We also saw this in the natural gas markets in the Northeast. That basically is a cry for infrastructure. So when we see that, we know that we can produce this at the wellhead. I can assure you that the prices that we're seeing in New York of 100 to $150 per MMBTU a couple of weeks ago in the New York area, 
were not translated at the wellhead. They were still getting between four to six dollars at the wellhead in the Piance Basin or at Henry Hub, Louisiana. So it didn't translate there. That price spike was really unique to the regions that had the constraint in terms of infrastructure. So when it cries out for infrastructure like that, the market will repair itself if we see high prices like that. I'm a big believer that the, the market will respond to high prices, it will respond to low prices, and what we will see is more infrastructure that will go into the Northeast. Doug, you want to add to that? Sure, I'll just echo that just a little bit further, and just if you look at track record as well, um, uh, Haynesville is one I'm very familiar with. Uh, you know, when the, the price of gas exceeded the marginal cost and allowed us to make a reasonable profit and we put our rigs to work, uh, within a span of about 36 months, that play went from zero to uh, over five BCF a day, uh, which is just astounding. Um, Marcellus is no, no different uh, and it continues to, to perform well today. So uh, the track record is there. And it's not there in just one place. There, there are multiple plays. There's been even new plays discovered uh, since the Marcellus and Haynesville and, and, and what have you that uh, just punctuate the ability of, you know, given, given the, the confidence in, in, in the price, the industry will step up and deliver the gas. That, that is uh, really not, in our minds, uh, not an issue. Um, as an example, again, in the Haynesville, we've never actually developed the Haynesville. What we were doing was punching a hole every square mile, because you have to do that here in, in, in the U.S., just to hold your leases in place. And, and so the pad drilling that, that Clay was talking about, we, we started doing that on very, very few sections. And most of our sections just remain undeveloped, other than the single well we, we punched, uh, just to hold the leases. A question for Adam and Andrew. So given the amount of contribution we've seen from associated gas from oil plays, in a world where there's excess oil production and oil prices drop, what does that do to the associated gas development costs, right, and prices that they receive, and to the whole resource base? Do people start shifting rigs? How long would that take? Or because oil is still so much more uh, profitable that they stay in those plays? Just based on some of the resource analysis work we've done on the North American tight oil plays, um, many of them are not on the margin in terms of cost of supply. There's quite a bit of variability across the plays, but um, uh, you know the, the, the price of oil is still set in global markets according to many different actors, OPEC behavior, spare capacity. Um, countries going offline and being slow to ramp back up. So the, the price of oil is not set in North America, but most of the tight oil plays that we have seen are not on the margin. So you can see some um, reduction in oil price and they'll still be in the money. So we don't see a dramatic impact on associated gas knock-on effects. Okay, and Adam, in your forecast? Uh, well, I think Andrew gave the general description. Uh, let me just throw some numbers out that uh, in many plays, uh, tight oil is probably still profitable down into numbers that begin with a six or a seven. Uh, and so 60 to, $65 to $75, let's yeah, just so, say. Right? Some lower, so, some lower. And, and Andrew just said some lower. <laughs> What that suggests is that um, there would probably be some movement, my guess is, within the OPEC countries to try to, to reallocate production uh, in that organization uh, at prices before you get to $75. Sure, up the floor. And Paula, question for you. So the Department of Energy is engaged in the Quadrennial Energy Review, and infrastructure and sustainability are two of the primary uh, factors people are looking at. When you start looking at the deliverability and resiliency that you talked about, how does that factor in the planning process for the QER, and in what time frame are we likely to see policies? Great. Um, thanks, uh, Frank. The Quadrennial Energy Review, um, as recommended by 
the um, President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology uh, a couple of years ago, I guess, is uh, it's getting itself ginned up to kick off. Um, and it will be uh, led by the White House, and the Department of Energy will be the secretariat for the very, very large-scale effort that will uh, encompass all parts of the federal government. I imagine many of you in this room, a variety of stakeholders. The first year, the, the, the process will proceed over four years. In the first year, we'll focus on uh, matters related to transmission storage and distribution infrastructure. And in doing that, uh, the matters of, in, in, of resiliency of that infrastructure will certainly be a key focus in response to not only natural disasters and severe weather events, but as well as other things that are increasingly of concern, such as physical threats and cyber threats. So there will be a variety of public roundtables and, and, and opportunities for stakeholders to provide input into this process. It's really intended to give us some insights into the challenges and opportunities that face our energy delivery infrastructure and where we need to think about making strategic investments. So um, more, more to come on that, but uh, certainly something that we hope will, at the end of the day, which is uh, by the end of next January, provide us with some useful insights and uh, policy thoughts for policy recommendations to ensure that we are building a 21st century energy delivery um, and movement system across the country. One of the things that is going to feed into that with regard to emergence, to in increasing the, emer the responsiveness of our energy delivery systems in the event of natural disasters is the Secretary has asked the National Petroleum Council to convene a study to address how to increase um, communications and in, improve emergency response for fuels delivery. Um, and so that process will be kicking off and we hope to have some results from that uh, before the end of the year. Okay, thank you. Okay, and as promised, we're gonna open this up to broader discussion and questions. We only have, uh, actually we have three rules. I was gonna say two. So if you raise your hand, you need to identify yourself and your affiliation. Um, wait for the microphone, because this is a large crowd. And if you can, ask your question in the form of a question. So, starters, it was all crystal clear. Sir. Neil, I didn't recognize you. I'm sorry, Frank. <laughs> Hi, Neil Brown with the German Marshall Fund. It's a question mostly for Paula, but also for Clay. The mention was made of these new sustainable shale gas zones, and I wonder what the state of play is in the administration on that, what the expected scope is, and um, whether you expect uh, congressional action or is it primarily an executive uh, enterprise? Clay, would you like me to take that one? <laughs> um, and so uh, thanks for the question. Um, the, the concept, and, I, and it's Clay touched on it a bit, um, these, the, these sustainable shale growth zones concept was introduced in the President's State of the Union speech uh, about a month ago. And, and it's, the concept is targeted to um, address some concerns that, that many people have, that this abundance will be realized in a sort of spotty fashion and not localized to where the impact, some of the impacts of extracting the resource are felt. So there's, a, for example, um, there's a real intent interest by the governor of Ohio and, and other um, investors in Ohio and in local communities in ensuring that as they develop the Utica, that they're able to do that in a smart way that also stimulates a, a, manu a renaissance in manufacturing and industry. And it's a great story to, to think about there in Ohio. You've got steel mills and you've got um, lots, of, uh, lots of skilled labor and a, a relatively increasingly robust delivery and transmission infrastructure and geology for storage. So there's, um, that's an example of where you might say, let's step back and again, use this period of abundance where we've got some, brand, some extra bandwidth to think about how to do things smartly and make sure this works for everybody. Now, 
All of that is all to be to say that the concept is in a state of development. So I think this is a good time for people to think about how could we realize that promise of turning these booms into something that's sustainable for communities, and importantly, that that's going to happen at the local level. Local level. So it goes back to Clay's point about in engagement matters a lot, and engaging different people in new ways, and making sure we're bringing everyone along. Okay, so my, my first answer to the question, when I, when I first saw it, I immediately sent an email to Paula. <laughs> so that was, that was my first response to, to get an answer. Um, I can tell you there hasn't been a whole lot of information shared on this at this point in time, but what I hope that we see is, as Paula explained, that, that it really is geared towards prevention of these boom-bust types of cycles that you sometimes see in, in mining or oil and gas extraction areas. What I would hope that it would lead to are educational opportunities for those who can work in these fields to increase their skill sets. What I hope that it would embody is bringing folks in from areas that may not have as much industry opportunity uh, somewhere maybe in the Midwest, in the Rust Belt, that could come into these areas and have meaningful jobs and, and new, new functions that would require new skills. So I would hope that it would have an educational component to it. What I hope that it does not have is, or does not infringe upon, is the state primacy over oil and gas regulation. So this is, I think, a, a very sensitive area. Industry has um, a little bit of trepidation about what it actually means, but it has not been explained fully as to what it does mean. But I think it actually can be a good thing, again, if it focuses on those areas that I mentioned at the beginning and stays away from the, the regulation side and allows the states to continue to regulate as they are, are able to do. Really quickly, um, since Clay touched on this point, to clarify, um, the, the President and uh, the Secretary and others in the administration are very keenly aware of the important role that state regulators play in ensuring the prudent development of our oil and gas resources. And, um, and, and, and are doing our best to support the increased capacity of those regulators to do their job um, and to do it very well so that we can all have confidence in how the resource will be produced. The, so the shale zones are intended to really address economic development and the economic promise presented by this tremendous ab abundance. So um, I know that we are going to have the opportunity to hear from Mr. Bretches and many of you about how best to do that. And uh, it's an exciting challenge to have. Okay, so we have one question, uh, middle section, fourth row back from here, and then we'll come down front. Good afternoon, Ariel Cohen, the Heritage Foundation. Could the producers, the Anadarko and uh, IHS, elaborate on the combination of fixed and operational cost so that we have a better idea uh, in uh, non-conventional oil, tight oil, and shale gas, what are the costs of production? And are most of the fields now profitable in the current low, low range of uh, prices for gas? And uh, what is the range for costs in oil? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll take a stab at this, just from Anadarko's viewpoint, I'll try to try to be as, um, answer the question as best I can. Are, are most of the fields in which we operate profitable? The answer is yes, or we wouldn't be operating in, in them. The variable component of production generally has to do with drilling of new wells. Um, so the service costs associated with the drilling and working over of these wells, that's where we put our capital. If these fields are not making money, then what we will tend to do is to produce them but we won't spend a lot of capital on them. So our capital allocation, which is public information to any and all in that, that can see this, you see where we, where we favor um, the areas that get the most capital. So in the U.S. onshore, if you were to take a look at, at how we spend our money, we spend most of our money in the Eagleford Shale and in the Niobrara Formation in and around the Denver Jewels Unit um, outside of Denver, Colorado. That's where the, the majority, the bulk of our spending goes. We have other U.S. onshore plays. Uh, we spend money in the Marcellus. 
um, because it's a dry gas field, we don't spend as much money there, but we, we generally put our money towards the liquid rich plays. In terms of the component of how we break out fixed versus variable, again, the variable side of it is, is primarily that capital spending that you will see on an annual basis. And so, uh, you know, just depending on this last year, we spent $7.6 billion in, the, in uh, total capital spending. About five of that was in the U.S. onshore. So it is really a, a, a play of favor for us. We spent a lot of money in this area. Uh, because it's very profitable and will continue to do so at, at current uh, prices. Clay, average um, shale well onshore, four million? Uh, it ranges uh, depending on how far you go with your laterals, but once you include drilling and completion costs, it can be anywhere from six to $14 million per okay. well. I, I think that's one of the keys. This is very variable depending on the type of play. You saw the huge geographical spread of opportunity in the map that Clay showed, while some of those are relatively more shallow wells, some of them are deeper wells, some of them have good access to uh, water, some of them have uh, less access. There's a huge range of um, operating conditions which drive economics, but, uh, you know, I would look at the actual producing results, natural gas production is increasing, even though the actual rig count is, is falling back. That shows that producers are finding it a profitable game to stay in. And it's also very, not only variable geographically, it's variable over time. So you saw the increase in drilling efficiencies again, the evidence from Anadarko. So the for a similar type well, because of drilling efficiencies, pad drilling, technology, costs are coming down. That race between cost and price is being addressed by application of technology and application of efficient operating practices to keep natural gas uh, profitable in what was a, a lower price environment. There's our salt area out. There's been a number of presentations around town, especially recently, about uh, mid-sized players having uh, higher capex than income. And so sequential, I'd so go back to Clay's point, if that were to, to reoccur over time, you wouldn't be in business, right? But a lot of people that spend money in the lease acquisition phase, so early on, if they, depending how much they spend on the lease, but now that they're in the production phase, that can change as well. So it's, it's, it's a more mosaic of a picture, I would say. Uh, right down in front here. Thank you. Chris Flavin with the World Watch Institute. It seems like one of the big challenges here is just that the field is moving so rapidly that, you know, EIA projections, you know, consistently have been outdated, you know, within a couple of months of, of coming out. So I, I want to see if, if we can think outside the box and, and really it seems like there's a good chance that, that, that supply is going to outrun any, you know, conceivable sort of short run growth in, in demand. I mean, I think that's at least, a, you know, a, a, a possibility. So then, I mean, where, where would the extra gas go? I mean, if we do have, you know, potential supplies that are significantly larger, I mean, maybe the prices will just get pushed to an incredibly low level. But, I mean, I, it seems to me like there are two possibilities. Uh, one is that we have see exports that are much larger than what's projected, that it turns out that, and I guess the question there is, what is the international price of gas going to be, both in Asia and Europe? It seems like that, some kind of projection there has to be factored in. And then the other possibility, of course, is transportation, where the question there is not economics, because uh, natural gas going into a vehicle is already half the cost or less than half the cost of gasoline. But, you know, the, assuming out to 2035 that nobody is going to take advantage of that money that's essentially sitting on the tra table to solve the infrastructure problem, again, I, I don't see that we're thinking outside the box yet, so I'd be interested in any responses. Adam, you want to take a first shot at that? Uh, um, sure. Uh, so in my uh, 18 months uh, at EIA, <laughs> I've worked very hard, Chris, to expand that time period of how soon to be proven wrong <laughs> from, uh, from a couple of months to, I think now I'm up to a couple of years, maybe. That's efficiency. Right. That's no, improvement. <laughs> uh, one of the things, uh, you know, where, where that's happened, first of all, it hasn't happened across all of the EIA's forecasts, you know, our electricity forecasts and so on. 
have been just fine. I think where the biggest problem has been is in this area of uh, the impact that uh, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling, and and uh, multi-pad, you know, multi-well pads uh, has combined to create a, a, a technological revolution in production. So what we've managed to do there is to uh, publish this drilling productivity report that comes out monthly that has estimates of current and one month out uh, production, which is getting us a lot closer uh, to having uh, an accurate starting point for the production uh, coming from uh, these uh, six huge uh, oil and natural gas um, shale plays. The Eagle Ford, Permian Basin, Niobrara, Bakken, uh, the uh, Haynesville, and Marcellus. So since most of the production growth is coming from those six plays, if we can track those six plays and maybe even add a couple of to that, including let's say Utica um, and maybe Granite Wash or something in, in that area, uh, we will have gone a long way towards solving that, that issue. Uh, let me come back to your first comment about is supply going to outrun demand? Um, for natural gas, that's really hard for that to happen because uh, there's a certain amount of demand that's there and, and you're not going to supply more than the, more than the demand. Um, so I think that you, you correctly guessed the outcome, uh, and we've already seen that in one sense, is lower prices. So if supply begins to outrun, begins to outrun demand, it has an impact on, on prices and drops those prices. And, and what we saw, uh, for example, in 2012, is that uh, the amount of natural gas that can go into electric generation uh, displacing uh, other fuels, um, coal, but, uh, you know, and, and uh, others as well, uh, is is a lot. I mean, it can absorb a lot of, of production in the, in the short run. And so my guess is, is that's what would happen, is that if we got that um, extra shot of supply for whatever reasons, it, it would result in lower prices, and those lower prices would drive something at the margin. Um, and, and the easiest thing to displace in the short run is uh, other fuels in electricity generation. And I suppose, and this would be ironic, wouldn't it? Uh, I'd have to put um, gas liquids back into that. <laughs> yeah, because that's, I mean, that's why gas to liquids went out, uh, because the price of gas went up and then it, then, then it wasn't as attractive. Uh, and if the price of gas went down um, and, oil, and oil prices went up, then uh, you would, you'd find it more attractive to, to do things like that and even and in fact to move faster on some of the transportation uses for natural gas like LNG and trucks, rail, marine transportation uh, and so on that that uh, could be um, could go faster if the economics were were right. Uh, just a couple of things. I, I would reiterate what um, Adam said. 2012 is, is when we really saw what happens when supply outruns demand in the short run. So in addition to the price collapsing below $3 and the coal displacement, we had storage. We totally ran out of storage. So we, and even though we built a lot more storage capacity over the preceding few years, all of a sudden there was no place to put this gas. They started shutting in wells. Um, so. So that's how you manage an oversupply in the short term. The price collapses and, and your storage, you know, builds up to record levels. This year then, we, we came into this winter with a very healthy storage balance and it took, what, two months of extremely cold weather to drive those storage facilities to where we're now skirting, or we're setting new lows for storage. Uh, Fill. And, and so short run, it balances that way. Um, and, and then on the heels of that, we are having prices firm up and the firmer prices will stay in effect for as long as it takes to replenish the storage balances to sort of average or, or balance levels. 
So a longer term view, I, I think I would agree with Adam, is that you, over the long, longer term, you don't have supply outrunning demand or vice versa. Um, that, you know, if, if you, you know, if, if the extra supply were to persist, the price would come down until supply comes down and, and balances demand. I don't think the demand could go up higher. Oh, absolutely. But, but I think... Anybody, I'm asking if it goes beyond the projections that we've seen, where would it go? What, how are we going to... Oh, okay. I thought you were talking about yeah. demand outrunning or supply outrunning demand. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, demand, yes. Uh, well, I think what we see is there's potential in all kinds of different areas and it's kind of whatever the opposite of death by a thousand cuts is. It's, you know, you get a BCF, extra potential here, another two BCF there, and pretty soon you're talking, you know, real money. Where it comes, it, you know, out of all the, all the possibilities, it's really hard to say. Um, so I, I don't think we could pick our horse, but, um, but I, I think there, there are a lot of opportunities to be, wrong on the downside, I mean, or anyway, to be underestimating the potential, yeah. And Chris, part of it is the infrastructure that we all keep coming back to, right? So gas deliverability is basically by pipe, unless you can cool it and deliver it, you know, by truck or rail. Um, oil, like one of the, the beauties of the fungibility of oil, it's, it's rail, truck, pipe, barge, a bunch of different things. The second piece, and we really didn't touch on this too much, the concern had, had been on the public side about demand um, outpacing supply, right? And so what does that do to price spikes and how fast is deliverability? If you posit the other case, the low demand case, right, which is a nightmare for producers, but it also sets in motion, and we've seen this in the power generation sector, if we had growing demand, there was room for nuclear, renewables, gas, you know, you, you took out coal. As demand is flat or declining, we start cannibalizing fuels and people make short-term decisions. And that's where kind of the policy piece comes in that's complicated this. And I, I, I thought actually Mary's presentation was interesting that long-term, right, that the resource base covers demand, but at any year in time along that path, you could get a hiccup where all of a sudden demand emerges and the infrastructure's not there yet. And that's one of the, that's what's going to be one of Paula's problems to figure this out so that it's a smooth transition. Um, so Bob. Frank, the, the low demand case usually goes along with the low economic growth case. And, right. And yeah, if right. we have the low economic growth case, we're going to have bigger problems than, than just than <laughs> than <laughs> what's going to happen with natural gas. And, and this will only take 30 seconds. So I think you want to go back to that slide that I showed second. Where does the gas go? In addition to electric power generation, you got industry, and within industry, it's refining, it's bulk chemicals, it's food processing, it's metal smelting, it's cement, it's glass. You're talking about a, a huge potential for a pickup in industrial output in the U.S., some of which we're already seeing. Glass half full kind of guy. Okay, so we have a bunch. Let me go, Len, on this side, and then I'll come back across the middle. Hi, Len Coburn, independent consultant in Maxwell School. Uh, one of the things I have not heard anybody talk about is the potential of EPA stepping in and doing some sort of study or regulation that will be federal in scope rather than state in scope. Uh, most of the regulation is now at the state level. Everyone's happy with that, perhaps. Uh, what does uh, EPA regulation do to disturb and upset the apple cart? On the supply side. On the supply side. Clay, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. So let me just start by saying that presently in, in the states in which we operate, we feel like the state primacy over oil and gas regulation is adequate. In areas where there are issues that exist, for example, in the, the Marcellus or the Eagleford, where you have rapid ramp up of activity and impacts on communities that have not been impacted in that way before, we feel like the councils of excellence working with regulators, local regulators, to make the regulation better is a good idea. As per the NPC study, one of the recommendations that we made on state regulations, particularly in states that did not have regulatory bodies before, or big oil and gas regulatory bodies, was that they impose a tax on the industry, particularly in these, these new growth areas, before the production began, because they're not going to be getting royalties, they're not going to be getting severance taxes until the production starts. So they need to have proper regulation in place when these plays start. 
So it really doesn't matter if you're talking about state government or federal government. What you need to have is adequate regulation. You need to have well-trained regulators, and you need to have effective regulation that is more less prescriptive and more performance-based. So now I'm going to get specifically to your question on, on whether the EPA would be involved in this. It would be hard for me to envision that the EPA could be more effective at regulating oil and gas in a particular area than the states that already do this and have been doing it for years, maybe tens of years or hundreds of years. And it's hard for me to envision because these people know, they know the, the business, they know the, the areas in which they are regulating, and so they're very effective at it. So to think that we could just come in there in one fell swoop and have federal regulation over these oil and gas operations is, to me, far-fetched. I think, importantly, what we need to do is make sure that we have adequate regulation so working with groups such as Stronger, the State Review on Oil and Natural Gas Environmental Regulation, IOGCC, the or excuse me, the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission, those organizations that help make state regulations better is a much more important job of EPA rather than trying to do the regulation themselves. Again, my opinion. Okay. So, Paul, I'm going to flip the question around a little bit for you. So, as a government policymaker, you can make, um, you have to deal with the economics, uh, foreign policy, environmental safety, community aspects. So, you might get a suboptimal agriculture policy or suboptimal energy policy because it's all about trade offs. So, what kind of space does that put you in when you, when you have to deal with these kinds of issues? Wow, that was a different spin on the question. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they pay you the big bucks. <laughs> careful what you ask for from Frank. Um, so, wow, that's a, I'm going to have to think about that one, but I, but I'll do, I won't do that online. Um, these are, um, I think there is, I will, I'll go back to a point I made earlier, which is that there's a tremendous appreciation for how the potential for the abundant, realizing the abundance rests at the local level and ensuring that that happens in a prudent um, manner to rest at a local level as well. And at the Department of Energy, we partner very strongly with organizations like IOGCC that, that Clay mentioned to ensure that to the extent that we're doing basic R&D on material science, production practices, new technology, that we're sharing that information with regulators as a means of helping them inform their policy, working the, with them to help them develop new tools like the risk, a risk-based data management system. Um, EIA does a lot of partnering with them as well so that we can help understand um, and make available data about oil and gas operations. And this, in the long run, also um, answers some of Chris, the, the, the questions that Chris was raising about, you know, how, how are we ensuring that we're making good decisions and one thing's not outpacing the other. Increasingly, over time, it's about better information in real time so that, that we're making better informed decisions. So um, there's a tremendous appreciation, I think, for continuing to look to the states to ensure the prudent and responsible development of our resources and to increase that capacity. Um, at the same time, there's a tremendous appreciation of the important role that industry leadership will also play and that it's important that we are all working together, w whether it's um, state regulators and in, in, in industry leaders, um, other advocates, um, people like me across the administration who want to ensure that we're taking the necessary actions to ensure the per public confidence. Not only will we re develop the resource prudently in this, from an economic perspective, but also that we will do it with respect for our communities and our, na and our other natural resources. Great. All right. Uh, a couple minutes left. I'm actually going to take three questions, and we're going to start on that side. So the second row here on that side. And then we'll combine them all. We'll then come to the middle. So the other one in the middle. And Jeff Epping with Enagis LLC. Just a quick question on uh, methane hydrates. Uh, Mary, you mentioned the Japanese are working on that. Uh, truly, in, in North America, uh, resource, unconventional resources are large. But do you ever do you see feedback if methane hydrates are successful, uh, especially in countries that can't develop gas shales as easily as the U.S. and feeding back and making the supply even larger, the resource base, let's say. Jeff Price, Blue Wave Resources. We've had a lot of talk about uh, supply, meaning production, demand. What we really haven't talked about is 
uh, the interstate pipeline network. To what extent are you seeing that as a constraint on the kind of growth that we're talking about? It's clear it's going to have to grow, it's going to have to change. Uh, there are constraints and issues we see, for example, with coordination uh, with the uh, electric power industry, which uh, I, uh, IHS Sarah is seeing expanding greatly. What constraints are you seeing? How are you seeing them being removed uh, to ensure that uh, we don't derail the growth you all see? Uh, thank you. Uh, Sam Sadel with the Howard Baker Forum. I have a question mostly for Mary. You were speaking about increased demand, or sorry, lessened demand on LNG. Uh, what you mentioned both the questions of methane hydrates as well as oversupply of liquefaction capabilities. What are the signposts that you're looking for for LNG demand both on the low side as well as on the high side? There you go. We'll talk about interstate pipelines, and I would say that we are actually going to start, Sarah's going to start up an electric uh, power and grid series here because we realize that that's coming into play and we have to do this in totality. And then the third section, we'll talk about LNG, and, and Mary, we can start with you. So we'll start at the back end and work our way through, and if you've got uh, opinions on any of these topics, raise your hand and we'll let you have your say. Go ahead, Mary. Okay. Um, I'll start with the LNG. Uh, situation, global demand. Right now, the global demand for LNG is about 35 BCF a day globally. Right now, the U.S. consumption is over 70 BCF a day. So the entire rest of the world market is only half the size of the U.S. domestic market. At the same time, we've got all these proposals here in the United States to export LNG We've got the Russians saying we're going to get there first. Um, we've got Australia coming on strong, Middle East, finds in the Mediterranean, off of East Africa. So the, if you sum up the total of the proposals to supply this market, even if, you, even if the market doubles in the next um, 20 years, you've got more, almost more than enough proposals on the books to accommodate that supply, I'm sorry, almost enough projects under, under development to supply most of that market. And then if you add all the proposals that have just been floated out there, you're going to swamp the market. So we see, or I see, the, the biggest danger on the downside is that everybody in the world develops their liquefaction projects and there's no demand there for it. That will collapse the global price of gas, and a lot of projects are just going to go bankrupt. So, I mean, were, were that to happen. So, so um, we see a big risk uh, that the global demand is not going to materialize to accommodate all the, the people that want to sell them LNG. And, of course, everybody wants to sell LNG to Japan and Korea because they think they're going to get, you know, a $20 price or a $15 price for their $4 gas. And of course, the Asians want to buy our LNG because they think they're going to get a $4 price. Um, so, so there we have, the, we have those um, issues. Um, methane hydrates comes in here because the Japanese along with a, a, a cooperation or, or joint projects with the Department of Energy and, and I think USGS and, and other American agencies have succeeded in extracting methane from the hydrates in uh, several different ways. Uh, it's rather high cost now today. The Japanese think they will be able to do it commercially within the next decade. Um, and again, what, what is a sustainable cost in Japan is very different from what would be a sustainable cost in the United States. So if Japan were to succeed there um, and become self-sufficient in natural gas, there goes a big chunk of your uh, market for LNG. 
Um, so that, that's one of the signposts I would look at. Another signpost would be the number of new uh, LNG plants coming on, export projects coming on globally, and just look at how quickly uh, the, the market is satisfied with, with supply. Um, so I think that's... Japan nuclear is another... another yes, place. yes, good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take a shot at high grades. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I'd rather answer the pipeline question, so let me do that. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at hydrates. I'll have a go at hydrates just, just briefly. We did look at hydrates in, um, in 2011 for the North American context, and it, it's a resource in abundance all around the continental shelf and in the Arctic. Um, for North America, we thought that it would be a much longer uh, time frame to bring that into commerciality, probably 50 to 70 years, just basically because of economics, technology development, and the fact that we have a, a new onshore unconventional resource base. It's far more likely that it will take off earlier in a country like Japan, as Mary was saying. They have the economic in incentive of competing against high LNG prices. Um, they're working the technology, um, and they have a, a, a big market. So we could conceivably see it earlier in Japan than in North America. In North America, we concluded that the early breakthroughs was likely to come in the Gulf of Mexico, but probably around mid-century, mid not before. If I could jump in on um, methane hydrates before we move on to Adam's excitement about infrastructure. Um, the, we also, at the Department of Energy, have a, an MOU with the state of Alaska, to do, um, which has set aside significant acreage for field testings on production of methane hydrates. And uh, this is vital work for us to do. Uh, there was some conversation er earlier about what energy security means, and this type of work is exactly the kind of work you want to be doing if you care about energy security over the long term. One way to think about it is where we are on methane hydrates is sort of where we were on sh um, shale uh, technologies for shale production in the late 70s, early 80s. And the work that we did, the investments that we made then in R&D is what's helping us to realize as a country the abundance that we have today. We need to continue to do the same thing on methane hydrates. Really quickly before I pass off to Adam on, the, on infrastructure, the Quadrennial Energy Review will give us an opportunity to look at this infrastructure issue on a regional basis because the, the challenges to the extent that we're seeing are very locational and regional with respect to natural gas infrastructure and the solutions will, will come out of those regions. And there's nothing to suggest that we need a moonshot here. Um, that this is very doable, and the, Q, the QER is going to give us an opportunity to have those discussions, and there will be, the roundtables will, will therefore be very regional, located in the regions in order to get that local flavor. So on the, the pipeline question, I mean, I think uh, Paula was very tempted to do the same thing, is to, to actually generalize on that. It's not just pipelines. It's uh, refineries. Our refineries were set up to, in the Gulf Coast to run heavy sour crude, and now we have an abundance of light sweet crude. How do you deal with that infrastructure question? Uh, uh, North Dakota is the second largest oil producing state in America now, uh, and that's not a traditional oil producing region, so it doesn't have the same kind of pipeline uh, takeaway capacity for either oil or natural gas that, that it would have had if it had been in, in in the Permian Basin in Texas. How do you deal with that question? Uh, we just had a really interesting lesson, I think, with uh, the propane uh, problems in, in the Midwest and uh, natural gas pipeline constraints in New England uh, during the cold weather. Um, how do you, it it's, it's, kind of reminds me of that, that whole point that, that they used to make, uh, still do, in, um, in the internet technology. How do you, that last 50 feet, you know, or maybe the last 500 feet or the last mile to somebody's home, how do you get the propane and natural gas, you know, to where it needs to be, when it needs to be there, is a, is a really uh, good question to ask. And, and I think the QER is actually going to address some of that. At EIA, what we're going to try to do is improve our ability to uh, drill down and and look at things in more detail uh, 
so that we can uh, get a better understanding of energy movements uh, between pads and from state to state, and in some cases within the states, from county to county, particularly in the Gulf Coast region. Uh, even in Texas, which has probably the, the U.S.'s greatest infrastructure for oil and gas, the Eagle Ford is really outside of the traditional box of oil and gas production and getting the oil and gas out of the Eagle Ford has, has proven to be, to be an issue. And so uh, uh, I, I think that e for at least, I mean, we can't build pipelines at EIA, but I think we're going to try to to uh, look at those issues and be able to comment sensibly on, on uh, where the bottlenecks are. On the natural gas side, I think it's worth just pointing out that for the last several years have seen a very significant build out of natural gas pipelines as new plays have come into the system. You know, first of all, in, in Texas and Louisiana, more recently out of the Marcellus. It's one of the reasons the Marcellus has been able to grow its production by leaps and bounds because it's getting piped out. There's a bit of a lag always because investing in infrastructure, you need to be confident the molecules will be there to flow. So there's that lag. But I think the industry has been remarkably successful, has a great track record of getting pipe in place into these new producing areas and linking up with markets on the natural gas side. I think that, that system works quite well. Doug, Clay, final thoughts? Last thought on the pipeline issue is we see increase, we see these big ramp ups in production and we see a lot of need for infrastructure. We're going to need to have effective regulation because again, if you're going to have that social license to operate, what you have to do is you have to be able to operate these pipelines safely in an environmentally sustainable way. So we need to make sure that when we put these in, we've, we're doing it right and that we have adequate and effective regulation is going to be incumbent upon us to have more regulators in the areas in which we're putting these pipelines across. So I, I, would, I would actually argue that that's, that's an area that we're deficient in right now. We need to make sure that we've got the, the right regulations and the right regulators in place. So we will post all the presentations at our website. I thank you for your uh, attendance and your uh, attentive attendance. Um, and please uh, join me in thanking our panel. It's a terrific discussion. Thanks very much. <laughs>